Good morning. Please be seated. Well, I bring you greetings this morning from High River Baptist Church in southern Alberta, Canada, that is praying for you, praying for this body this morning, praying for the leadership, and praying for the proclamation of the word of God to go out forth this morning. Brothers and sisters, let's begin in a word of prayer. Father, we are before you this morning in need of your grace, in need of the strengthening work of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Your word tells us that your truths are spiritually discerned. And in and of ourselves, we cannot understand. Lord, we pray that your spirit would guide us, would lead us in truth, that the scales would fall off of our ears, our, our eyes, that our ears would be unstopped, that we would understand what you would have to teach us this morning. Your spirit would apply it to our hearts. Lord, would you take your truth and plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, are any of you afflicted? Are any of you hurting? Are any of you in pain? In sorrow? Perhaps in despair? You have been? You maybe currently are? And I've got news for you. If you're not right now, you will be. Because there comes a time in every person's life when we're confronted by extreme difficulties. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, In this world, you will have what? Trouble. Tribulation. Now, Jesus was not simply or merely describing the everyday challenges and problems of life. He was that, but more than that, he was referring to the circumstances of overwhelming difficulty for every believer. Yes, there are certainly terrible difficulties that are common to all men and women simply because we live in a fallen world where the effects of sin are continually experienced, aren't they? However, there's a unique affliction, a peculiar affliction that only the people of God can claim. For we as believers have three vicious enemies that assail us, that seek to destroy us. And these are, of course, what? The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the fallen, sin-loving, God-hating world system that is at enmity against God. And then we have the flesh, our own fallen flesh nature that constantly wages war in our members against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. As Paul said in Romans chapter 7, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And then we have the third enemy, the devil, Satan himself, who seeks to destroy us. Now it's interesting, that word that Jesus used in John 1633 for trouble is the Greek word thalipsis. Thalipsis. If you're interested, it's T H L I P S I S. Th thalipsis. Now, that word denotes extreme pressure. It means to be crushed, to be squashed, to be compressed. And in some translations, Perhaps yours, tribulation is the word that's used in John 16, 33. And that's a very good word. That's a good translation. For tribulation is also a derivative of the same word. And in Latin, that word, the root word is tribulum. Tribulum, which means to be crushed under extreme weight. In fact, the Romans had a procedure of crushing wheat under a roller a large roller, and the, the roller would go over the wheat and absolutely crush it. And that roller was called the tribulum. In ancient England, according to their law at the time, prisoners who refused to willingly assent to the decree of the court had heavy weights placed upon their breasts until they either recanted or they died because they couldn't breathe. And that process was called the thalipsis. 
the crushing weight. Well, there's our Greek and Latin word study for today. But why did I labor to mention all this? Because, friends, we need to understand that as, as we look to the cry of David in Psalm 3, that we're going to be reading in just a moment, and the circumstances of his life, we need to step as best as we are able into David's shoes and experiences the circumstances, the affliction that he was under. It was unimaginable difficulty for David. And yet, perhaps for some of us, it may not be so unimaginable. You may have been, or maybe you're currently in these crushing circumstances, seemingly overwhelming life circumstances. These extreme difficulties may be life-altering medical afflictions. They may be the death of a loved one, a spouse, or a child, or a dear friend. You may be hated and openly persecuted for your faith in Christ because of an unbelieving spouse or parents or maybe by even one of your own children. Or perhaps, my friends, your affliction may be the result of your own doing. The natural consequences of sinful decisions that you've made, as they were in the case of David before us in Psalm 3. Or they may be the result of all of these circumstances or others coming upon you. Now, because we as believers do have these three full-time enemies that conspire to destroy us. Are we then to be surprised by the trials of life? Uh, are, we ought to understand that Jesus gave this clear warning in John 16. He said, in this life you will have trouble. And likewise, Peter provides a response to the trials and afflictions of the Christian life. The Christian life, he says, when they occur, when they occur, not if. He says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you, which come upon you, why? For your testing. He says, don't be surprised as though something strange were happening to you. So what are we to make of all this? How are we as children of God to interpret our circumstances? Martin Luther said, listen to this. Martin Luther said, what, whatever virtues tribulation finds us in, it develops more fully. Here's what he meant. If anyone is carnal, weak, blind, wicked, irascible, haughty, and so forth, Tribulation will make that person more carnal, weak, blind, wicked, and irritable. On the other hand, if one is spiritual, strong, wise, pious, gentle, humble, he will become more spiritual, powerful, wise, pious, gentle, and humble. You see, what Martin Luther understood is that the circumstances of life, our trials and our tribulations, only increase more of that nature which is in us. It's very important. And well, Peter clearly says this is so because immediately after telling us not to be surprised at the fiery ordeals, he says this, but to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory, you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. Psalm 3 offers for us as believers comfort and confidence Comfort knowing that our sovereign God who works all things, all things according to the counsel of his will is directing the circumstances of your life for your ultimate good and for his glory. And so far as we who believe share in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ, 2 Corinthians 1.5. And Paul would say, we have this confidence, writing in Romans 8, that for those in Christ, 
No trouble, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness, no danger, no sword shall separate us from what? The love of Christ. And then Paul tells us that not only are we conquerors of all those things in Christ, he uses a superlative word. He says we are super conquerors. And so finally, despite the fact that all our enemies intend to cut believers off from the earth, God designs by these afflictions to make us ready and fit for heaven. But in between, we have tribulation. So just before we read Psalm 3, I want to give you the background for our text today. I want to paint for you the picture, or perhaps more accurately, be the cinematographer to help show you the camera angles of the events and the circumstances that was facing David and that he was referring to as he wrote this psalm. The superscription, if you're looking at Psalm 3, I invite you to turn there. If you're not there in your Bibles, look at the top of Psalm 3. There's something that's called a superscription, which is part of the inspired word. And it says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Now that superscription is super helpful for us because it actually provides for us the context of what is going on when David wrote this. Matthew Henry called this superscription, he says, this is a key hung ready at the door to open it and to let us into the meanings thereof. And it's so because it tells us precisely the historical context. Now the graphic, terrible, devastating turns of events in David's life are described for us in excruciating detail in 2 Samuel chapter 13 to 16. We had part of that read in the scripture reading this morning and we don't have time to look at all, all of those three chapters but I encourage you to do so this week. You'll be very blessed. But as an overview, we're introduced to Absalom in 2 Samuel 13 and verse 1. And it begins, it said, what you remember, it said, now after this. It says, now after this, it was that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister, and her name was Tamar. After this. After what? Well, the after this is after David had sexual relations sinful sexual relations with Bathsheba. It was after David had Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, murdered in a wicked conspiracy to cover up her pregnancy. It was after the prophet Nathan, who was sent by God to David to rebuke him for his sin, and it was after God told David that because of his sin, the Lord said, the sword shall never leave your house because you despised me. And it was after David said, against you and you only, Lord, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And it was after God had promised David that because of his sin, God would bring him to open shame. I am going to raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives from before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you, David, did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and in open daylight. And then finally, after David's son, born to Bathsheba, died, as the Lord also promised would happen. You see, it was after this, after all these things, that the camera pans and we are shown Absalom in chapter 13. And it says, and now it was after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister and her name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, was in love with her. Did you catch that? Amnon, the son of David, was in love with Tamar. You mean to say after all this that David's son Amnon is sexually attracted to his sister. 
Well, yes, and this is not good, and it's not going to end well either. For without recounting the details, we're told that Amnon deceived and raped his sister Tamar. We're then told that David did nothing to address that sin. We're told that Absalom becomes enraged about the violation of his sister, and for two full years he hatched a plan to deceive and entrap Amnon, following which Absalom was murdered. Or Amnon was murdered. And following the murder of Amnon, Absalom fleed to Geshur to hide from his father David, and he stayed there for three years. Following the three years in exile, at the request of David, the king, his father, Absalom was invited to return to Jerusalem as David was seeking reconciliation. But for two years after Absalom came back, he did not see his father. What did he do? He conspired to overthrow the king and steal it for himself. And in a sham ploy, Absalom finally went to his father David in a mock reconciliation. He even prostrated himself before the king, all the while hiding the evil intention in his heart. And then it was after this, we're told in 2 Samuel 15, that Absalom hatched the plan, basically an uprising, a coup, and it says Absalom deceptively stole the hearts of the people, as we read this morning. 200 of the king's men defected to Absalom, and even Ahithophel, even Ahithophel, the king's trusted counselor, confidant, turned against David, and he cast his lot in with Absalom. And the Bible says this, it says, and the conspiracy was strong, for the people continually increased with Absalom. And then it says, a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the people are with Absalom. So David said to his servants who were with him in Jerusalem, arise, let's flee, for otherwise none of us will escape from Absalom. Go quickly or he will hurry and overtake us and bring disaster on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Then David, along with all the men loyal to him, fled from Absalom, his son. He crossed the brook Kidron, ascended the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. So my friends, it's in this context, the context of David's crushing, crushing affliction, his tribulation, his thalipsis that we must have in mind as we read Psalm 3. So just as we're about to read Psalm 3, you'll notice if you look there, the word Salah, Salah. Now, theologians are not absolutely sure on what that word means, but one of the things that they do agree on, whether it was a poetic device or a musical device, it means stop, pause, reflect on this, meditate on what's just been said. And so as we read through it, I'm going to briefly pause so that we can do just that. This is the word of the Lord in Psalm 3. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no deliverance for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me and around about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Selah. In verse 1, he says, David says, O Lord, how my adversaries have increased how they have risen up against me. 
You see David in astonishment, and, and remember, he's fleeing his, he's fleed his kingship. He's left Jerusalem. He's fleeing from his son who's seeking to murder him. And in, he looks about himself at his circumstances, and he cries out in distress at the number of his enemies. This mighty king who at once had the hearts of all the people now finds an unimaginable change of circumstances has taken place. And yet, in one sense, it's, it's not unimaginable, is it? Nor is it unexpected. God had told David through the prophet Nathan that he would suffer greatly for his sin. He was told that he would be humiliated openly and publicly as a consequence for his wicked relationship with Bathsheba for the subsequent murder of Uriah, her husband. Indeed, whom God loves, he disciplines and chastises. So what is important for us to understand here is that David is no stoic. You know what I mean by that? No stoic. He, he's not a deny and hide your emotions and keep a stiff upper lip kind of guy. That is just not Christian, friends. That's not biblical at all. Nor is he on the other end. He's not an alarmist. He doesn't panic. He looks about him. He evaluates his circumstances and he rightly concludes that things are very bad. Yeah. And he freely admits the desperation of the situation, his pain, his hurt, his anguish. Not only have his enemies increased, the number of forces become overwhelming. His own Son, Absalom, has conspired this wicked uprising. He's masterminded his father's destruction. Not only to steal his kingship, but to take his very life. Now one can hardly imagine a more painful experience than to have your own child despise you so much as this. Yet for King David... I believe there may have actually been an even more painful cut than that. For a king, his most trusted relationship was that of his closest counselors, his advisors. Ahithophel, Ahithophel, his counselor, had turned his back against him and thrown in his lot with Absalom. In a terrible betrayal. Spurgeon commented on this. He said, Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. Well, now here is a note of exclamation. I love Spurgeon. You've got to love this preacher. Here is a note of exclamation to express the wonder of woe which amazed and perplexed this fugitive father. Alas, I see no limit to my misery, for my troubles are enlarged. There was enough at first to sink me extremely low, but lo, my enemies multiply. When Absalom, my darling, is in rebellion against me, it's enough to break my heart. But lo, Ahithophel, Ahithophel has forsaken me. My faithful counselor has turned his back on me. Lo, my generals and my soldiers have deserted my standard. How they have increased that trouble me. But I want you to note something of most important. Note that David, when he's afflicted and buffeted by these extreme circumstances, even though, yes, he's experiencing the wages of his sin, as it were, the consequences of his sin, in the midst of that pain, where does he go? In his physical flight from peril, fleeing Jerusalem and fleeing Absalom, to whom does David flee in the spiritual sense? Matthew Henry commented on this. He said, yet he did not therefore cast away his confidence in the divine power and goodness, nor did David despair of divine assistance. Even our sorrow for sin must not hinder our joy in God, nor our hope in God. So whether you're experiencing difficulties and afflictions of life in this fallen world, whatever they may be, Perhaps you're suffering the promise of affliction for your testimony of Christ and for his gospel. Whatever the circumstances, friends, the spiritual shelter for our souls is known 
only by the children of the one true God. He alone is our rock and our redeemer. He is the one in whom we find shelter. To whom David goes in affliction is to whom the same person we must likewise flee and hold on to. You see, the unbeliever does not, in, indeed cannot, find comfort and safety in God, in their unbelief. But the Christian finds more, that the more the severe trials are of life, that the stronger we cling to God. Because he is able to comfort us in our afflictions. Does a verse come to mind when I say that? He is able to comfort us in our afflictions. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who what? Comforts us in our tribulation. And... Whether else should we go but to him? When anything grieves us or frightens us, David was now at a distance from his own prayer closet. He was far from the courts of God's house, where he used to pray in Jerusalem, and yet he could find a way open heavenward. Matthew Henry says, wherever we are, we have access to God and can draw near to him wherever we are driven. In verse 2, he says, Many are saying of my soul, There is no deliverance for him in God. Or your translation may may say, There is no salvation for him in God. As David fled for his life, weeping as he went, barefoot with his head covered, things are certainly horrible for him. And yet, it gets unbelievably even worse. Because as he enters Bahurim, 2 Samuel tells us that along comes this individual named Shimei who follows alongside David and his entourage and he's openly scorning and mocking him and throwing rocks at him. And Shimei is one likely among many who hurls this terrible invective as he screams at David. This is what Shimei said when he cursed. Go away, go away, you man of bloodshed, you worthless man. The Lord has brought back upon you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul, in whose place you have become king. And the Lord has handed the kingdom over to your son Absalom. And behold, you are caught in your own evil, for you are a man of bloodshed. Yes, what Shimei is saying here is in effect, there is no help for you in God. David, your sin has placed you outside of the reach of God. There's no chance for mercy for you. You are anathema. You are accursed. Spurgeon said, doubtless David felt this infernal suggestion to be staggering to his faith. If all the trials which come from heaven, all the temptations which ascend from hell, all the crosses which arise from the earth could be mixed and pressed together, they would not make a trial so terrible as that which is contained in this single verse. There is no help for you in God. It is the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to fear that there is no help for you in God. My dear friends, if our sins are capable of removing us from the reach of God's grace, then Christ died for none. If his righteous blood is not sufficient for atoning for our sins, then no matter the depths of our sin, then indeed we are without hope. This is what the enemy wants you to believe. Has this ever happened to you that suddenly a thought comes into your head and it's something like this? It's like, well, that's it for you. That's it for you. Now you've done it. Why would God ever allow you, you foul, rotten, unholy man or woman or teenager or child, why would he ever allow you to come into his holy presence? Do you not know that the scripture says who can come into his presence except he who has clean hands and a pure heart and look at you? Have you ever had thoughts like that? Now these accusations often 
assail God's children. They come like fiery darts from the evil one. They are fiery darts from the evil one. And with accusations like this still ringing in David's ears, what does he do? Well, he does what you should do when our three enemies of the world, our three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, assault us. David turns from himself and he puts his focus where? On God. He clings to God. He reminds himself of God's own character. His truth, his word, his promises. He reminds himself what God himself has revealed. David says, but you, Lord, are a shield around me. You're my glory. You're the one who lifts my head. You see, the enemy accuses David and says, you're finished. God is no help to you. But David says, what do you say, God? What saith the Lord? May God be true, but every man a liar. God, what do you say? Well, is David finished? Is there no help for him in God? On the contrary, when David turns from himself and reflects on God's truth, he comes to a radically different conclusion. You see, not only is there hope for David in God, there is, but he finds that there is hope for him only in God. David finds that God is his shield. God is David's shield or or buckler. Your, Your text may say buckler. He's David's wall of protection all about him. What can man do to me? There are over 11 verses in the Bible where God is referred to as a shield or a buckler for his people. And in every case, there's a direct relationship or correlation between that word shield and what it means as a promise or a consequence for us. If God is our shield, what does that mean for us? For example, in Psalm 5, it says, Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with favor as with a shield. In Proverbs 30, we're told that every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Psalm 91 says, He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. And time would fail us if we were to list all of them. But here's one more. In Psalm 18, it says, You, make, you Lord, make your saving help my shield, and your right hand sustains me. So what is the consequence here for David in Psalm 3? In what way does he find the shield of the Lord a comfort and a help for him? Well, as we read, we see that David's brilliant logic His biblical logic leads him to understand that as his shield, God ultimately has David's salvation completely assured and under his sovereign control. And because of this knowledge, God, as David's shield, brings him real comfort. He brings him peace in the midst of his afflictions. And this peace is so critically important because it's a peace that's antithetical and completely alien to the world's understanding of peace. Only in Christ can we have peace, total joy, a rejoicing in our afflictions. Do you you get that? We rejoice in our afflictions. That's just completely absurd to the world. Have you ever thought about that? Only in Christ do we have the peace that passes all understanding. What is this peace? Jesus, Jesus said shortly before his arrest and his crucifixion, do you remember this? He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So he's describing this peace. What is it that this peace that he humbled himself for to the point of death, even death on a cross, to give us, to bring us? What is this peace that is completely opposite and unknown to the world? Well, Paul tells us clearly in Romans 5 that because we who believe, 
have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We were all once alienated from God and without hope in the world. We were at war with God and his enmity, his wrath was upon us. You were once not a children, a child of God, but now you are a child of God. Yes, Christ brought us near to God through his perfect obedience to his Father's will by humbling himself to the point of death. Christ brought us peace, not as the world brings peace. But he saved us from God, having perfectly fulfilled the law. He suffered the wrath of God that we deserve. When he hung on that cursed tree, he was made sin to be sin on our behalf. What, when he cried out, Tetelestai, he said, it is finished. Not I am finished, it is finished. What did he mean? That certificate of debt for our sins was taken out of the way. It was canceled. And now we who have turned from our sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we're freed from bondage to sin. We're no longer slaves of Satan, but we're slaves of Christ. And we're his brothers and we're his sisters. Now the world, you see, knows nothing. Nothing of this. Worldly psychology and philosophy counsels us that to have peace, we need to escape our circumstances. We need to get out of a difficult marriage. We need to drink our problems away. We need to medicate ourselves into a state of altered consciousness in order to find peace. Or, or maybe just distract yourself with worldly pleasures. Well, this is not, this is not a believer's peace. Do you remember Jesus' words in John chapter 16 when he was speaking to his disciples and he warned them of the intense persecution and the afflictions that were going to come upon them? And that is why he said, in this world you will have tribulation. Do you remember that? However, Jesus bookended that statement with two incredibly comforting truths for his disciples, which we should always read in accompaniment of in this world, you will have tribulation. Do you know what those bookends are? He said this, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. You see, he's overcome the world. He's defeated sin and death. He will keep those who are his and of all the Father that has, has given to him, he will lose none but raise him up at the last day. John chapter 6. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've, if, if you've read all your Bible or not, but spoiler alert, Christ wins. In fact, he's already won. So, in your afflictions, as you walk in obedience and daily repentance, know that Man can do nothing to harm you eternally. Oh, they may kill you. They may kill you temporarily. But Christ will raise us up together with him. First Thessalonians. Christ will bring us home. We have this assurance as an anchor for the what? For the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast. Christ who's entered through the veil. Hebrews chapter 6. Oh, I love Spurgeon on this again. He said, this is our comfort. We are immortal until our work is done. Mortal still, but immortal. So let us never fear death then, but rather rejoice at the approach of it. Since when it comes, it comes only at our dear bridegroom's bidding. <coughs> David says in, in verse 4, he says, I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. Selah. What, what can be said about this except that which is really so patently obvious? David goes to God, who is his refuge and strength. A very present help in times of trouble. When the prayers of the saints are offered in faith, God hears your prayers. Not because of the wonderful eloquence of your words, but actually <laughs> despite them. The Bible says that we don't even know how to pray as we ought. 
But the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Romans chapter 8. In 1 John 5, it says, this is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, then we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. In our afflictions, the Holy Spirit pleads on our behalf in longings that are inexpressible. This is the invisible but always perfectly effectual prayer ministry of the Holy Spirit, my friends. And because of this, David says, I lay down and slept. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Oh, in these verses we have the orthopraxy of David's biblical knowledge. You know what I mean by orthopraxy? Okay, so we have orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Okay, orthodoxy is a truth. It's a, it's a biblical truth. For example, God is light. In him there is no darkness. Okay? Orthodoxy. An indicative. It tells us something, a profound truth about God. Tells us something about his nature and about his character, but it tells us nothing about how to apply that to your life, does it? Profound truth. God is light. In him there is no darkness. So, but truth applied is orthopraxy. It's the imperative. It tells us the therefore, the so then, the what does this mean to you? For example, indicative. Orthopraxy, God is light, in him there is no darkness. Imperative, orthopraxy, what does this mean to you? Therefore, walk as children of light. As Christ walked, so walk like he walked. Like here in verses 5 and 6, David applies truth to his life. And we see here that he just doesn't have this head knowledge of God but that he's hidden these truths in his heart. What did he say? Lord, hide your truths in my heart so I might not sin against you. He wants to walk in a way that honors God. And these truths have changed his life. Have his circumstances changed? No. They're still dreadful. But he knows. He knows. He knows. The peace of God that surpasses knowledge. He knows that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. He knows that God will never leave him or forsake him. And because David knows his God, he has peace. He has what is called rectitude. It's a settled deep knowledge about the truth of God so deep in your soul. Why is it, do you think, that the Apostle Paul could be in a stinking prison in Philippi after having been illegally arrested, in the dark, in chains, seemingly without hope of survival, and despite that, he can count it all joy. Really? Really. Because Paul counts it joy, and he counts it worthy, he counts it an, a blessing, a joy to be counted worthy enough to suffer for the sake of Christ. He knows that in, because of this, in this prison, he can lead a Bible study. He can sing prayer, sing hymns and offer prayers to God and evangelize. Paul knows that God is fashioning him into the likeness of Christ. You see, he, God is using Paul as his witness to a lost and dying generation that does not know God and does not know Christ. At Paul's dramatic conversion, do you remember what he was told? He was told how much he would have to suffer for Christ's sake. This is the clear teaching of the Bible throughout. If you are a believer, if you are part of the called in Christ, it is your duty as a good soldier of Christ Jesus to suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel. 
2 Timothy 2. For what reason? For the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. A.W. Tozer said, when I understand that everything happening to me is to make me more like Christ, it immediately resolves a great deal of anxiety. Indeed, David can lay down in the midst of his affliction. He can sleep because he's applied God's truth to his life. On this verse, the Puritan Thomas Watson, he said this, I laid me down and slept. Huh, a good conscience before God can sleep in the mouth of a cannon. Grace is a Christian's coat of armor which fears not the arrow or the bullet. For grace may be shot at, but never shot through. Grace puts the soul into Christ, and there it is safe. Or how about Job, that righteous man, reflecting on God's sovereignty in his afflictions? What did he say? Even though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. And he said, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I will see God, whom I myself shall behold. My friends, do you know something of this? Have you counted the cost in following Christ? Because suffering is the cost of discipleship. Suffering is not an anomaly. It's not something that is unusual that ha should sometimes happens to a believer. Suffering is the cost of discipleship. And this is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer came to understand. And it's why he wrote the book of the same name. You should read it, The Cost of Discipleship. So now David, having admitted the seriousness of his plight, having affirmed the truth of God, what God has revealed, he now calls upon God to deliver him. He says in verse 7, Arise, Lord, save me, my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Well, David here is undoubtedly referring to and reminding himself of his previous victories against his enemies. Even overwhelming forces that came out against him were given into his hand through what? The sovereign intervention of God. David is reflecting upon God's faithfulness in his own life, the acts of God's deliverance. And by man's evaluation, there were multiple circumstances that appeared hopeless and defeat certain during David's reign and many of his campaigns. However, what God determines to occur shall occur. Deuteronomy 31 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. See, when you and I promise always or never, we are always incapable of upholding it. However, when God promises always or never, he is fully trustworthy and can be trusted to honor his word. And so, I think we should be greatly helped by two things here, as David was helped. First, bring to remembrance the faithfulness of God in your own life, from your own past experience. Second, read the truth about God's character. Tozer said, the most important thing about you is what comes into your mind when you think about God. Know God. God, what saith you? What saith you, Lord? My enemies accuse me. What saith the Lord? The more we can bathe our minds in, the, in these truths, the greater our confidence and comfort will be in the Lord. You see, what David can know only in figures and shadows about the eternal, eventual victory of God and his plan for redemption of all things, we, on this side of the cross, we understand more fully. This mystery, as Paul would put it in Colossians, this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, has now been revealed. You see, for David, God's faithfulness was demonstrated in both his promises and his action. 
And for us, it's exactly the same. However, however, what David could only see dimly and veiled, we see clearly. The veil's been removed. God's promise of rescuing us from our enemies, from the world, the flesh, and the devil, they've been accomplished. Our Lord said, in this world you will have trouble. This is the already and not yet to our present life in Christ, isn't it? You know what I mean by that? The already but not yet. Are you saved? If you're in Christ, you're saved, but you will be saved. Are you sanctified? Yes, you're set apart for God in Christ. You're set apart to be holy, but you will be sanctified. He has already put to death, death. And he will come again in glory to fulfill his perfect plan and his completion of all things. And then in verse 8, David ends with this. It's brilliant. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Selah. These final two verses are a testimonial. They're David's testimonial. And if, if you're in Christ, they're your testimonial. How is it that you came to be here? You were once not a child of God. Now you are a child of God. You were once in the kingdom of darkness. You're now in the kingdom of light. How is it that you came to be here? What is your testimonial? This is your testimonial. From the Lord comes deliverance. This testimony should remind us of Jonah, chapter 2, and verse 9, where Jonah cried out, salvation comes from the Lord. What David says here, salvation belongs to the Lord, is the sum and substance of salvation by grace alone. Spurgeon said this, so search the scripture through, and you must, if you read it with a candid mind, be persuaded that the doctrine of salvation by great grace alone is the great doctrine of the word of God. This is the great point concerning which we are daily fighting. Our opponents say salvation belongs to the free will of man, if not to his merit, at least to his will. But we hold and teach that salvation from first to last in every iota belongs to the most high God. It is God who chooses his people. He calls them by grace. He quickens them by his spirit. And he keeps them in his power. It is not of man, neither by man, nor of him that wills, nor of him that runs. But it is of God who shows mercy. When we profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are sanctified as holy to God. We're sealed with the guarantee of salvation, ready to be revealed at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And from that point on, the Holy Spirit lives in us. This is what Christ in me, the hope of glory, means. Colossians 1. The Holy Spirit is translating, revealing, reminding, guiding, keeping, guarding us. Keeping our hearts. Sanctifying us to become more like Christ. Oh yeah, our, our enemies are going to mess with us. But our souls are off limits. Because we're his. There's nothing that we can or need to do to earn it. His righteousness is all sufficient. He paid the price. So, my friends, when the lies of the evil one come to you and say, there's no deliverance for you in God. There's no help for you in God. I say, we reply, I come on the invitation of the man on the middle cross. He said, I can come. Nay, he bid me to come. And even more than that, he said, I must come. Uh, yeah, in our brokenness and, and through our obedience, he uses our lives to spread the message of the gospel across the face of the earth until every ear has heard. We should be gladly spend, spend ourselves and be spent for the spreading of the gospel. And as David discovered, we can be strong 
and courageous. We can have peace and confidence. Why? Because the source of our strength lives in us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. If I can just take a moment. I want to speak to you who are here today and you're not a Christian. So glad that you are here. You're not a believer. Uh, I want you to know that you have no peace. While you may be carrying on in your life, eating and drinking and making merry and following the course of the world, Please be under no illusion that this temporary worldly peace that you feel will protect you from God. What do I mean by that? The Bible says that God has temporarily overlooked the ignorance of earlier times. And he commands all people everywhere to repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. He set a day when he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, and that man is the man, Christ Jesus. And he furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. The Bible says that today is the day of repentance. Today is the day of deliverance. I implore you, do not leave this place and say, I'll think about it later. I'll decide tomorrow. Don't presume upon the Lord that you will be able to repent later. I want you to know that I I have seen the tragic end of many men, women, and children upon whom death came suddenly and unexpected. Your life is like a vapor. It's here and then it's gone. You awoke to see the sun this morning. Make no assumptions you'll be here to see it set tonight. My friends, Jesus offers you peace with God. How? Through the cost of his shed blood that he willingly poured out for you. He offers you his robe of righteousness. He bids you to come and drink from the stream of life without cost. He says, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. He says, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. He says, whoever beholds the Son and believes in him has eternal life. And he says, he will hold you and guard you and keep you until the last day, and he will take you home with him into eternal dwellings. My friends, today, if you are hearing God's voice, do not harden your heart. Do not resist the gospel of grace. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now church, as we close, please allow me to give once again that great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon the last word. Speaking on Psalm 3, Spurgeon said this, The Christian will be sure to make enemies. It will be one of his objects to make none. But if doing what is right and believing what is true should cause him to lose every earthly friend, he will regard it as a small loss, since his great friend in heaven will be even more friendly and will reveal himself to be even more gracious than ever. You who have taken up his cross, don't you know what your master said? I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Christ is the great peacemaker. But before peace, he brings war. Where the light comes, darkness must flee. Where truth is, the lie must vanish. Or if it remains, there must be a stern conflict. For the truth cannot and will not lower its standard. And the lie must be trampled underfoot. If you follow Christ, you will have all the dogs of the world yelping at your heels. If you live in such a manner as to stand the test of the last judgment, you can depend upon it that the world will not speak well of you. He who has friendship with the world is an enemy of God. 
But if you are true and faithful to the Most High, men will resent your uncompromising commitment, since it is a testimony against their iniquity. You must do the right thing and not fear the consequences. You will need the courage of a lion to pursue the course that turns your best friend into your fiercest foe. But for the love of Jesus, you must take your stand. To risk reputation and affection for the true sake is so demanding that to do it constantly, you will need the moral principle and power that only the Spirit of God can work in you. Do not turn your back like a coward on Christ. Play the man. Follow boldly your master's steps, for he has made this rough journey before you. And it is better a brief warfare and an eternal rest than false peace and everlasting torment. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for revealing to us your promises. For telling us that you are our shield and our buckler and our strength. Lord, thank you for revealing to us the unsearchable riches of Christ. And Father, we pray that as we have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so we would walk in him. That as you sent out us out as lambs amongst the wolves, that we would be firmly rooted in our faith and built up in Christ. Lord, please help us. Help us by your spirit, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father, that no one would take us captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men and the empty principles of the world. Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We ask this in his precious name. Amen.